My first hot case was a disaster. The intensivist stopped me after three minutes and said we need to sit down and talk about how to do a hot case. I'm here to save you from this embarrassment. My name is Ken Hoffman. I'm an intensivist at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. Today we're going to talk about the structure and purpose of hot cases for the Australian New Zealand College of Intensive Care Medicine Fellowship Examination. The hot case component of the exam consists of two 20-minute clinical examinations designed to assess you in the clinical environment. In those who've passed the written exam, the pass rate for the hot cases is 60 to 70 percent, although only 30 percent of people pass both hot cases. This is why the hot cases are considered the most stressful component of the exam. But it's also the closest representation of your job as an intensive care doctor. I hated how artificial hot cases felt initially when I started practicing them. But, as much as I hate to admit it, training for hot cases has made me a better intensive care doctor. After a lot of practice, I began to enjoy the challenge of trying to figure out what was going on with an intensive care patient with very little information provided. At this point, it is important to say that there are a lot of excellent intensivists who did not pass the hot cases first time. This is a very difficult exam, and not passing the hot cases doesn't mean that you're not good at your job. If hot cases feel artificial, why are they included in the fellowship exam? The hot case component is the only time the examiners get to assess candidates in a clinical environment. The real objective of the hot cases are to assess the candidate's professionalism, experience and clinical competence when actually standing in an intensive care unit. Remember, this is a finishing or exit exam. You are expected to demonstrate that you can safely and independently function at the level of a junior consultant. The first step towards this is to have the knowledge and clinical experience to be able to do this. The second step is learning how to play the hot case game. In this video, I'm going to talk about a generic hot case structure. It is important to remember that there is no one single right way to do a hot case, but there are many wrong ways. As you practice hot cases and make mistakes, you need to develop your own personal style. Even the college examiners all do things differently, so make sure you practice with many different supervisors to receive varied feedback and synthesize this into your own personal style. The general structure consists of six components. One, the question. Two, an entrance. Three, the end of the bettergram, four, the examination, five, the presentation, and finally, six, a period of Q&A. On the day, you'll be escorted to the bedside by a bulldog. They will assist you to don gown and gloves if that is the policy of the unit you are in. They will also pass you any equipment you require during the examination. However, I took my own stethoscope to the actual exam, believing it had magical powers and special juju because I'd heard murmurs with it before. I also can't hear a thing with the bedside play school stethoscopes. This is acceptable, but you must clean your stethoscope after each hot case. We'll start with the question. Outside the room, once you've washed your hands or gowned if required, you'll be given a stem with a clinical question. You may choose to or be asked to repeat this back to the examiner to confirm your understanding of the question. You then have two minutes to think about the mistakes you've made in your life to end up in this position. Or, to use this time more wisely, to think about what you need to focus your examination on to answer the question that has been given to you. This is the best time to decide if you're going to need to perform a neurological examination to answer the clinical question. It is also useful to think about what direction the presentation will be heading in and what questions may be asked during the discussion. If there are any key trials or guidelines that you think may come up, such as the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines or ANZIC's statement on death and organ donation, try to upload them into your working memory. Next is the entrance. 
After two minutes, the examiners will invite you to enter the room. I had a checklist of things to do immediately after entering. One, make sure the lights are on. Two, draw the curtains. And three, gel my hands before touching the patient. There would usually be a bedside nurse with the patient and I would always acknowledge them as soon I'd be ruining their perfectly folded sheets. If the patient was intubated before going any further, I would ask if there were any communication barriers, such as language or deafness, that were going to impair the examination. If it was relevant to the case, such as a trauma patient, now is also the time to ask if there are any position restrictions that will affect your examination. Finally, as part of the entrance, you need to introduce yourself to the patient and explain that you'll be examining them. Some people choose to expose the patient at this point. I would do this later during my exam so the patient didn't get cold. Next is the end of the bedogram. This is where you play a game of count the machines to figure out how many organs are requiring support. This is also the time to stand back and get an overall impression of the patient. Make a point of looking around the room for clues like wheelchairs or walking sticks, cytotoxic bins, visible medications to be drawn up on the nurse's trolley, or my personal favourite, the wall whiteboard, which often has information like ventilation weaning plans or massive transfusion product tallies. Photos of the patient with their family can be useful to show pre-morbid state and psychosocial support, as well as suggesting the patient has been in the intensive care unit for a long period of time. Once we've had a good look around the room, we can start the examination itself. Everyone does this slightly differently, so please adapt this to your own style. I always started with the infusions, as this provides the most information about what is going on with the patient, and checking the sedation, plus minus paralytic infusions, provides context for the rest of the examination, particularly neurological findings. I would then move on to the monitor and interpret the vital signs in context of the infusions that are being used. Use the monitor to act as a trigger to ask if there's been fevers in the last 24 hours. Whilst at the head of the bed, it's a good time to look for any drains, scars or C-spine collars. Enteral nutrition is often kept near the infusions, so now's the time to check if the patient is being fed. As a tip, Instead of asking non-specific questions, like is the patient tolerating feeds, make a point of asking specific questions, like has the patient had any vomiting, or have they been any high-volume aspirates? This is also a convenient time to ask about the quantity and nature of the respiratory secretions, if you can't see any in the suction tubing. Before we continue the exam, now is a good time to discuss whether or not we should report exam findings during the hot case. Some people choose to remain quiet during the hot case. This can look incredibly polished if you can synthesize and present all the information very well. The risk is that you may notice something but then forget to mention it in your presentation and the examiners may then assume that you missed it. At the opposite end of the spectrum, some people like to talk the entire way through their hot case. This risks the balance of the signal to noise ratio and may actually annoy the examiners. I personally found the middle ground to be the most effective. Comment on relative positive and negative examination findings. In addition, try to provide some interpretation of the findings that you see. For example, don't just say the EVD is clamped. Say the EVD is clamped but there's a large amount of bloodstained CSF in the bag. I wonder if the ICP's been high or if the patient had hydrocephalus. I have been informed that regardless of whether you talk during your hot case, unless you mention a finding in the presentation, you will not score points for it. With this in mind, I would still verbalise relevant positive and negative findings to help load them into my short-term memory. One consistent thing I have heard from several examiners is that speaking like an unnecessarily verbose Shakespearean physician is really annoying. You wouldn't say, Hark, I note the blood pressure is elevated on your ward round, so why would you say it in the exam? Just try to speak normally. Back to the examination. As we leave the head of the bed 
we should walk around the bed, paying particular attention to any drains, and especially the urine bag. If they are present, you should ask the output. And, if the urine output seems very high, you should ask if they've been given frusamide recently. The next stop is the ventilator. There is a chance you may be unfamiliar with the brand of ventilator being used. Some people then immediately ask the settings. I decided that as a competent adult with eyes, I could usually figure out the mode, FiO2, PEEP, tidal volume and rate, even if I'd not used that brand of ventilator before. You should take in all of this information and then synthesize it and subdivide into mild, moderate and severe respiratory failure. Now is the time to examine the patient. I was always told you should be examining the patient by around the two to three minute mark of the hot case. In reality, with a very thorough end of the bedogram and looking at the machines around the room, I found this gave me more information about what was going on than the clinical examination often did. So I often took between four to five minutes. This is probably a bit slow. Before launching into the examination, inform the patient again that you're going to expose them for the exam and then begin your sheet origami. There is no right way to do this, but make sure the groin and female breasts remain covered for the patient's dignity. I would fold the top part of the sheet down to the waist and then tuck the lower part of the sheet between the patient's legs. It doesn't really matter how you do it, but make sure it doesn't look like it's your first rodeo in the actual exam. By now, you should have made your decision about whether or not you need to do a neuro exam or whether or not you need to do any other focused exam of the patient. I'm not going to cover the patient examination in this video, but make sure you look for all lines, tubes and scars as they can provide a lot of information about what's going on. The examiners will notify you when you have one to two minutes left and ask if there is anything else you would like at the bedside. This is not the time to present a shopping list of investigations. They are asking if there's anything else you would like to examine at the bedside like you would on your normal ward round. You should always have at least one additional thing to ask for so it doesn't look like you have thought poverty. Examples include asking to look at the back for pressure areas, asking for an otoscope to look for a hemotympanum, or asking for fundoscopy as you want to make your life harder than it needs to be. Whilst you shouldn't ask for investigations, I always thought a chest x-ray and the most recent arterial blood gas should be considered part of your routine ICU ward round examination. You will then be asked to take your gown off, wash your hands, and present to a quiet area to report your findings to the examiners. This brings us to the presentation. I always found this the hardest part. Remember, for the presentation, you have been asked to answer a clinical question. You will not receive marks if you present a three-week comprehensive management plan if the question that you have been asked is whether or not the patient is safe to be extubated. People get hung up on trying to pick a ninja diagnosis. In reality, you need to examine in a systematic way, synthesize the information in front of you, generate a list of most likely diagnoses or current issues, and request relevant investigations which will guide an appropriate management plan. If you do this in a professional manner as one of the examiner's colleagues and are courteous to the patient and the nursing staff and respond to them appropriately, then it doesn't matter if you miss the ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency syndrome. The final part is a Q&A session where the examiners ask directed questions and you interpret the investigations that you have asked for. I always liked this part of the exam as I was no longer required to present a free-flowing monologue and I knew the finish line was now in sight. After this finishes, thank the examiners for their time or thank your supervisors for assisting you with a practice examination. The final point to make about hot cases is that you will get better with practice. Remember that every time you have a practice hot case that goes badly, you'll get better for next time. Embrace the uncertainty, and if you do enough of them, you may, like me, pathologically start to enjoy 
the intellectual stimulation of pretending to be Sherlock. Thank you very much for listening. If this was useful, please hit the like button. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel.